Hello. The fantastic presentations just keep coming, don't they? I hope you're really enjoying yourself and having a great day. We have our final three in today's concurrent sessions coming up. So please warmly welcome these next presenters as you enter their sessions. Stephen Coombs will be talking about the University of Queensland's Andrew N. Liveris Building, engineering design to support innovation and industry engagement. Mahari Donohoe is speaking on selection bias and benchmarking, a masterclass on better practice. And finally, Dr. Susan Blackley looks at grassroots strategic leadership, the impact and agency of academy fellows in universities. As you're enjoying the presentations, please remember to ask questions, get involved, be engaged through the online chat system and tell us how you're enjoying the presentations by completing a survey as you exit each session. I hope you enjoy the concurrent presentations. I'll see you again soon. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. Welcome to um, the following session. I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Um, please, if you are engaging in social media today, use the hashtag uh, Tim Conference. Um, if you have any difficulty with the session, please click on the red headset at the bottom of your screen and speak to someone in the lobby who will be able to help you with any tech issues. Um, there will be hopefully some time for Q&A today, so if you'd like to pop your questions in the Q&A box, please do. And, of course, we encourage you to engage using the discussion forum. So today we have the absolute pleasure of three special guests with us today. We have um, Nari Donahu, the Director of Facilities and Services Group at Swinburne University. Nari um, originally is from Scotland and she graduated from the University of St Andrews after studying biochemistry for four years. Wow, there's a story there. She spent eight years working as a researcher in Berkeley, California and Cambridge um, for the United States Department of Energy and the UK Medical Research Council. In 2016, she hit our shores and moved to Sydney and successfully transitioned out of the lab into a project manager role at the Victor Chang Cardiac Research Institute. Um, where they were constructing a new state-of-the-art research facility on the St Vincent's Precinct in Darlinghurst. Uh, Neri now lives in Melbourne and graduated from the Melbourne Business School in 2016 with an MBA. She currently leads the management and operation of Swinburne's facilities, including student residences, property, space management, assets and infrastructure. Today, Neri is joined by Yolanda Wozni, the Associate Director of Property and Space Management at Swinburne University. Yolanda is responsible for the management of Swinburne's property portfolio, including space management, leasing and property-related income and expenditure. In her time at Swinburne, Yolanda has contributed to the development of an urban design strategy and space management strategy for the Hawthorne campus, which looks to the best use and planning of assets into the future. Prior to joining Swinburne, Yolanda worked as a senior development manager and project lead for the University of Melbourne's major projects, in which time she contributed to the development of some of the university's landmark STEM projects, including WEBS and the Biomedical Infrastructure Program. 
Yolanda and Mary are joined today with Matt Perry, a Senior Associate at NH Architecture. Um, Matt's been an architect and project manager with over 25 years design and construction experience. Um, previously, Matt has worked client-side with RMIT Property Services and Catholic Education Melbourne, offering him a 360-degree view of tertiary education property management. And with those introductions complete, I'll just now hand over to Neri. Are you starting or Matt? Thanks very much for that great introduction, Fiona. Uh, and thank you very much for joining Matt, Yolanda and I today to, for our talk on selection bias and benchmarking. Yolanda and I, as Fiona's already mentioned, worked together at Swinburne. Uh, we started working together here in 2021 and Matt Perry from NH Architecture worked with us developing a space management strategy and plan for the university. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge the um, Swinburne's campuses. Oh, I haven't done a very good job on this. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> um, thank you. So just with our first slide, we'd like to just kick this off by talking about COVID and the international student commencements. So here I'm just showing the fall in international student commencements in Australia between 2018 and 2021. You can see when those international student border, uh, international borders closed, the student commencements in the university sector dropped rather rapidly. I'm also showing the change in the number of students in Victoria as well. You can see that in 2019, there was a drop. We just had over 400,000 students commencing, and then that's fallen to just under 200,000 in 2021. And this obviously impacts a large number of different sectors in Australia, not only tertiary education. Next slide, please, Matt. Within the higher education sector, that sudden fall in revenue um, from international students has obviously led to a number of job losses uh, as universities were trying to manage their cash flow. And you can see here Victoria and New South Wales have been particularly badly hit, um, especially because they receive such a large number of international students. So across the sector, had a 4.8% drop in revenue in education. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to point out to you on the screen is the um, construction in progress. So the construction in progress in 2021 uh, was 0.9 billion, and that's actually an increase on the year before. But what we're expecting is that that might drop off in the next couple of years. As a lot of projects that were due to commence have probably been postponed and there's been changes in the capital investment and tech, the way in which university are looking at spending the money in projects in the future. The other number I wanted to point out to you on the screen is the repair and maintenance cost in the Victorian higher education sector. So that's 0 0.2 billion in 2019. And Yolanda will touch on this a little later when she's talking about benchmarking and when we're looking at construction projects and space management, because it's not just the construction cost that we're looking at, it's also the repair and maintenance cost and operational costs too. Uh, so over the next couple of years, what I'm anticipating is that there'll be a drive to maximise the utilisation of our current facilities, particularly given the large scale investment made over the last 10 years within the tertiary education sector in Victoria alone. And I'm expecting that the efficiency in design and use of new space will become increasingly. Important to drive down construction costs and. Allow further investment in technology. And teaching and learn there'll be innovative ways to reduce maintenance cost and improving their efficiency and effectiveness of the exam. 
existing infrastructure and assets will become very time. One thing that I'm very keen to make sure that we do uh, in our work is make sure that our benchmarking exercises are evidence-based and statistically robust and that we're using the best practices So Yolanda is going to take us through our view on how to assess space requirements. Right here, please, Matt. Today I'm going to talk to you about the um, quantifying the current supply and future demand for space and how that is always easier said than done. Um, when looking at the current supply and future demand, there are many inputs um, that we require data-wise to work from to get accurate um, picture and they, though some of those include like net seats, patient practices, um, funding available or commissioned or decommissioned net usable area. Um, next slide, please. So understanding this um, is in underpinned by utilisation and what what is indeed utilisation and how we measure it. So in previous versions of TEFMA space planning guidelines, there's been a, a specific way to calculate and measure utilisation. And in my experience, some of this was driven um, and makes most sense when applying um, or looking at teaching and learning spaces. Um, and when we talk about bums on seats, um, this is much more nuanced and diffi difficult to grapple with when considering labs and workplace, which, which are not quite as um, fixed in times of So um, next slide. So um, the available space, um, to establish the availability, we must understand utilisation. So the how much space do we have to use um, should always be asked before we build. And to understand the availability, we have to first understand utilisation because uh, utilisation underpins the available assets that we already have and have invested in. Next slide, please. Um, so when we're trying to ascertain the project, have 
built up a methodology that Schmarks or space metrics modifiers, which I talked about this requirement, um, and overlaying the modifiers scenarios. When um, investing millions of dollars in our infrastructure, our education infrastructure, there is never one outcome, um, but many possible outcomes that we can go down. Um, and the understanding of the modelling and the assumption, assumptions made up front will have a very la large impact on the cost, the success, the efficiency, and also have a long-term operational impact, as Murray spoke about before. So um, multiplier has a significant impact on the quantum or scale of the space required. Um, I guess a good way to consider the danger if you in this is our under Understanding of the average and the average is useful as a measure to compare or apply, but then you really need base requirement is out. Uh, next slides. Sorry. Matt. Um, if the space requires pounding impact on the project into TEFMAR benchmarks, which we've often uh, grappled with across um, development areas at tertiary institutions, um, you, we have to ask ourselves what averages and data underpin these? Um, what is relevant to our organisations at this point in time? Is it new builds or refurbishments that we're talking about? And what assumptions are made about the utilisation or the modifiers in doing this? Next slide. I'm going to hand over to Matt now for this. You need to unmute your mic. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you now. We just need to return the... There you go. Is that all good? I'm glad this is being recorded. <laughs> um, thanks, Yolanda. I'd like to take you through one aspect of a much larger space planning study that NH prepared for Swinburne earlier this year. Uh, two quick comments to start, one that is banal and the other that is intentionally mysterious. First, uh, from what satellite are we looking at ourselves? And secondly, beware the asterisk. Uh, if there's a tendency that's hard to avoid in our digitally saturated work home lives, it is availability or recency bias. Um, this is if something is recalled, it must be important. I think this gets harder as you get older as well. Uh, moderated by the sheer volume of imagery that is available to us, algor algorithmic editing and vividness uh, for designers think architecture, AU, arc daily, detail, etc. In this context, is time or the lack of it you commonly have to undertake space planning, master planning or enemy? How do we compare things over time? This chart is one way of comparing uh, university ERA rankings or research rankings um, over time based on their year of commencement. Um, and if you are taking a very simplistic view, you would su suggest to a university that the best way to improve their ranking is to get older. I'll be predominantly looking at higher degree by research um, spaces today 
And TEPMA planning guidelines uh, point to indicative allocations of between seven to 10 square metres usable floor area for every effective full-time student load, depending on your field of education. So this is what we'll have a look at now. And remember that range, seven to 10, or is that an average of 8.5, Yolanda? <laughs> um, data is interpretive all the way down, uh, shaped by where it's collected, how it's collected, and for what purpose, when. Let's have a look at uh, each of these in turn. Where do you look for the data? Well, like archeology, span where the most senior person at the dig is actually holding the brush, dusting off the relic in situ, space plan planners at the coalface often have the most comprehensive and complicated view of existing conditions. Uh, Amir, a, a senior space planner at Swinburne, became my best friend on the project and was always gently prodding me along with questions. Have you looked here? What about this? Why don't we look here? Here's Swinburne's densely occupied Hawthorne campus in Melbourne, an inner city location bisected by Glen Ferry train station. The station delivers close to 11,500 passengers on an average Tuesday, peaking at 8 a.m. 13% less travellers arrive on a Friday. Across the entire campus, the HDR allocation is 4.9 metres squared per desk. This seems pretty good against that earlier average I quoted of seven to 10, um, even considering some loading for part-time students. These desks uh, are allocated in 77 different spaces, uh, 14 buildings, and across eight schools as mapped here. There's some of their desk allocations. To... So what's in a number? Averages alone don't tell the story. Having a sense of curiosity, I think, helps to complete the picture. This is where the digging starts getting interesting. Uh, here are four examples of HDR space at the Hawthorne campus. From left to right, we see spacious, professional, open planning adjacent to supervisors in building AGSE, uh, weighing in at nine square metres per desk. Uh, next to that is the least spacious but most centrally located in the campus's oldest building, Building AD, that reeks renovators' delight. Uh, next to this, we see the most remote most derelict but arguably, arguably the most lived-in quarters in building AV. And lastly, uh, we see in building AMDC, the boxy but itself is made uh, somewhat of plastic. How do you frame or reframe information collected to, a, to create achievable space budgets? An approach we've found useful is to attack the problem from both the bottom up and the top down at the same time. This is De Bono's white and green hats, uh, a sage hat, if you will. Here's uh, two working examples of test layouts that we applied to an existing Swinburne floor plate. The first on the left, is a PhD student hub emphasising peer-to-peer learning, weighing in at 370 square metres or 11.3 metres squared per workstation. Now, the second um, on the right-hand side is an academic hybrid offering vertical integration of HDR students uh, with academic suites, and it's more compact at 320 square metres or 9.7 metres squared per workstation. Both of these mix hot desks, collaborative zones, meeting rooms and quiet spaces. And there's been plenty of excellent examples of these typologies being road tested uh, across universities in recent years. Now these averages seem a little on the high side, but uh, if you assume an operational overlay of one desk for, for every uh, three and a half full-time students, uh, 
you'll see that these ratios drop to 3.2 metres squared and 3.8 metres squared effect, um, respectively. And this is the practical impact of utilisation, which I'll now hand back to Yolanda to talk to in a worked example. Thanks, Matt. So, yeah, following on from our methodology that I talked through before for calculating the space requirement, we have here applied a modifier to Matt's HDR hub. Um, you can see here that the sharing ratio or the number of desks, desks per student or EPSL um, dramatically impacts the cost to accommodate our HDR students. So, so we're talking about students assigning desks for um, need as opposed to arbitrarily. So careful consideration of allocation and modifiers such as flexible and shared workplace reduces the infrastructure costs and can deliver improved quality of space. Um, savings can be reinvested into the research and teaching and learning um, at the university, which are our core um, drivers. Um, even a small metre squared per person change can have a $400,000 impact when applied to a cohort of 100 students, which you can see here um, between um, the one desk per 3.5 epsilon versus even the benchmark ratio, the proposed draft benchmark ratio of four metres squared per person, um, which, yeah, there's a difference there in four, $400,000. So it, it's very compounding when we apply it across our organisations. And again, that also has an impact on the operational um, budgets to maintain and um, maintain the spaces. Thanks, Yolanda. Uh, let's jump back out uh, briefly to a macro view now and look at what on the face of it is some unrelated data. Here's a map of shared study space, informal and retail space on campus, classic bump spaces. Um, it's quite nicely distributed across the campus, but only 38% of it is located on the ground plane. Close to two thirds of this space is not so readily accessible, and the distribution moves from the centre of moves the centre of gravity away from the train station to the heart of the campus, which is the lower corner of the screen. The R space uh, distribution on that earlier slide, uh, we discovered that approximately 17% of this space was located on the ground plane. So here's where the strategic uh, ideas come in. What if we flipped that HDR space? with the above ground study space you see on this slide. Uh, general use space becomes more accessible and PhD space more cosseted. Um, so that could be a win-win situation. Uh, recall seeing uh, a joke to this similar effect on this slide uh, in the New York, in a New York article recently with an accompanying uh, bit of a reflection by Paul Bloom, which talks to me about the fragility of our current circumstances. And yet there is something very human about our near bias, caring too much about what's about to happen and too little about the future. We struggle to defeat near bias, to be like Ulysses, who had to tie himself to the mast so that he could hear the songs of the sirens and not follow them into the sea. Do benchmarks get old and die? Of course they do. But some benchmarks live surprisingly long lives. Ultimately, though, the essence of the HDR experience is hopefully a great sense of achievement. Uh, being able to push that button to submit your thesis, as you see my wife Michelle here doing, celebrating in your three square metre corral with colleagues with whom you've shared the arduous journey for some or all of the way, and possibly a few hangers on for champagne in this instance. But this also begs the question, like the thought experiment that find, found that uh, people who would prefer to have already had a much longer complicated hospital procedure than be submitted to a much shorter operation in a week's time, is this the same for HDR space as well? Thank you very much. Oh, well done, uh, Mary, Yolanda and Matt. Fantastic presentation today. 
We have a question from um, Emma. Emma is asking the question, is Swinburne looking at hubs for all faculties or each faculty can choose whether they have an assigned hot desk model? And I guess in the context of your presentation, we should address the answer more around HDR students than the broader question. Um, Mary, would you like to answer that question? Well, no, I think Yolanda's better at answering that than I am. Okay. <laughs> there we go, Yolanda. Catch. Let me, let me what, what was Swimmer looking for hubs for all of, um, no, essentially um, I think we have to weigh up what um, facilities we have as well as um, what we have to look at each of the spaces because you could see how scattered um, Matt's slide was about where our HDR um, students are located. I think that when we go forward, we when we're thinking about investment of new into new spaces, it gives us that opportunity to interrogate the model. Um, but it it's certainly very difficult to un you know unapply benchmarks that have already been set. But I think we're interested in in understanding the quantum of space available through um, those modifiers, such as um, not assigning space so much. So your modelling introduced um, either a hybrid model or a student-only model. Have you given any thought to how you might choose to implement that or if you've had any feedback from students and staff over which model to use? We actually did. I met with students um, with the Vice Chancellor a few months ago, and it was really interesting to hear a student's perspective might vary dramatically from an academic's perspective about the um, academic. I think the other thing you've got to consider is discipline. So whether it's um, STEM and requires access to labs and and elements like that. So I think that um, it, it's a balance of the two and that's why a hub or in some ways or understanding functionality like the function is important because pot potentially maybe they move into a hub in the writing up stage but then um, during the first two years of supervision maybe that's more in an academic um, model. Thanks very much, Yolanda. Any other final comments, Nari, before we finish up? Um, one of the parts that we found the most helpful is around those modifiers and those inputs in, in applying them systematically and, and not necessarily just taking a benchmark figure and then multiplying that out by a dollar amount and then using that in order to develop your cost plans. That really throws out your project costs and has quite significant implications later on. And I suppose that's really the take home. And is there any, any plans to publish your model? Obviously you've have got some TEFMA colleagues on the, uh, on the line today who are probably interested in uh, sharing your model. Is that something you're planning to publish or share? Well, I believe TEFMA's currently updating the space guidelines and that they'll be published shortly. And, and I think that that's part of an ongoing conversation as well about how to, you know, the peer learning what other inputs there are to consider and, and that continuous improvement. Terrific. Well, that uh, finishes our session today. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and uh, please return to the timeline to join the next session, the keynote presenter by Professor Debbie Haskey Leventhal. And there's a survey on exiting today's session. Don't forget to do that. And uh, we wish you all the best for the rest of your uh, conference journey. Please thank our presenters. Thank you. Thank you.